Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. I'm particularly excited about this one week long mini series in songs for the sons of Korah. It's a beautiful, beautiful, redemptive story. God poured out his discipline upon the original Korah in Numbers chapter 16 and then reiterated in Numbers 26. But then his descendants, his sons were allowed to live through the outpouring of God's just wrath on his family for their sacrilegious rebellion. And then those descendants would go on to produce some of the most exquisite of all the 150 Psalms. They're songs of gratitude to God. They're also songs that are prophetic about the Messiah, and they're quoted by Jesus on the cross. How incredible is that? All right, here are two of them. Psalm 87. The city he founded is on the holy mountains. The Lord loves Zion's city gates more than all the dwelling of, Z of Jacob. Glorious things are said about you, city of God, Selah. Think of this like, amen. It would come at the end, perhaps rhythmically, of the song, uh, of a part of the song structure's phrasing, right? Think of it like a, the, a breath between verses. I will make a record of those who know me, Rahab, Babylon, Philistia, Tyre, and Cush. Each one was born there. And it will be said of Zion, this one and that one were born in her. The Most High himself will establish her. When he registers the peoples, the Lord will record, this one was born there. Selah. What's, what's all the more uh, amazing about this is that just there are, there are stories of redemption baked into the names that have been listed. It's about God's affection for his city the city of Zion, the city of Jerusalem, the Lord loves Zion's city gates more than all the dwellings of Jacob, right? Jacob was a little bit nomadic for a while there, but man, ultimately the city that was founded in fulfillment of the covenant that was made with, uh, with Jacob's ancestor Abraham was beautiful. Glorious things are said about this city of God. And then we see Rahab mentioned here. Babylon. I mean, this was like a pagan nation that would overtake uh, Israel. Philistia. Right? The, these were enemies. Tyre. There were a lot of pagan practices that went on in Tyre, and even the king of Tyre became sort of uh, sort of an archetypal representation of Satan himself. All right, Cush. There's a there's a, a bit of a friendlier history uh, with with the nation of Cush, but this is this is all redemptive and. What's even cooler about this line to me is that it's written for the sons of Korah, meaning it, it was written for them to perform. They were like, they, they became worship leaders, uh, musicians, uh, established, I think, by, by David. He kind of made up this musical ministry uh, complete with, with a, a prophetic element to it. And when he registers the peoples, the Lord will record, this one was born there. So even though the sons of Korah have this slightly ignoble history to them. They know that they belong to God. They know that they are in Christ. Singers and dancers alike will say, my whole source of joy is in you. Everything about their joy rested in the promises of God to his people. Now this is old covenant, same God. Different covenantal context, but the same character of God, the same loving nature of God toward his chosen people. Now, Psalm 88 continues on a different theme, and it is a cry of desperation, right? Uh, it's a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah for the choir director, and it provides these, provides these melodic structures that could be used, okay? So uh, let's talk about this. My friends in certain congregations within the Church of Christ, there are musical instruments prescribed for these worship songs that were given to us by God to sing to him. There are even instrumentation suggestions. I mean, this is, this is so clear, all right? So my, my friends in, in, in the Church of Christ or perhaps some other forms of like Primitive Baptist who are anti-musical instrument, all right? I currently sit here 
surrounded by drums, <laughs> which some would call <laughs> the devil's instrument. All right, uh, I've I've seen it before. All right, man, what is it? There, here's here's a, a djembe, sort of an Americanized version of the djembe, originally designed for the Igbo tribe of Africa. That's a piccolo snare. There's a djembe that I bought in Kenya. Here's a black swamp multisonic European snare drum. There's some kungas back here that are Caribbean, and all of these instruments have been used to bring glory to God. And the you know the the, the instrumentation is is suggested, but it is suggested in the Psalms. Psalm 33.3 says, play skillfully to the Lord. It tells us this. It, 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 actually, it actually does prescribe not only playing music to God, but like, please don't suck at it when you do. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure on Christian musicians. Oh, and by the way, shout out to the worship pastors of the city of Nashville. All right, I drummed for a big church in Nashville and served there as a, as a teaching pastor. My wife was the preschool director. We love you, Hermitage Hills. Thank you for your gifts to our building campaign here at the Redemption Church. Um, you've probably never considered this, but like, wow, can you imagine being a worship pastor in Nashville and there are like Grammy winners in your church and you know that if you botch it, it's gonna be distracting for them. <laughs> that is pressure, man make music to God. And by the way, here are some songs that you can use when you do that. This one is more of a cry of desperation. Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out before you day and night. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry. Is anybody hurting right now? The Psalms have been an inexhaustible source of anthems for my soul when I've been weary. They give my heart, my broken heart vocabulary, and I am so grateful. They articulate with divine perfection exactly what my soul, exactly what my spirit needed to say to God. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry. For I have had enough troubles, and my life is near Sheol. Okay, this is this is an expression he's saying like I feel like I feel like I'm in the Old Testament uh I feel like I'm in the Old Testament equivalent to hell here. Right? Uh this is a Hebrew word sheol when it's translated to Greek it is Hades. I am counted among those going down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength. Man, if you're if you're feeling down in the absolute dumps, you feel like your life is a little bit like hell right now. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 88 has given your spirit vocabulary. Abandon among the dead. I'm like the slain lying in the grave whom you no longer remember and who are cut off from your care. Now, this is again striking knowing what we know based on yesterday's sermon about the context for the sons of Korah, that the earth opened up. And what Moses proclaimed was basically that they're going to fall alive into the pit of Sheol. And this will be a sign to you that what these guys, Korah and his 250 men, are leading is a sacrilegious rebellion. And Aaron and I are the ones who are called by God uh, to lead you into true covenantal peace with him, into the promised land. And so that's exactly what happened. These lyrics are reminiscent of the the story of the sons of Korah. You have put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. Your wrath weighs heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. We heard uh, this same kind of language dying in, dying in, in, uh, in uh, amidst the breakers, overwhelmed by the huge waves. He's equating his depression to these tidal waves that just overwhelm. And this is a common image theme among the songs of Korah. You have, dis you have distanced my friends from me. Anybody ever been there? Man, I have. I have. You have made me repulsive to them. I am shut in and cannot go out. Man, what really stinks is that that is a common experience in the church world. I, I genuinely believe that this right here, the way that Christians treat each other in the Pacific Northwest, is why we're not experiencing the revival that we're praying for yet. All right, the problem is not the non-Christians. The problem is not the gospel. There's nothing wrong with the gospel. We've got to fix our churches. We eat each other. 
We shoot our wounded. We are horrible to each other. And this is what's being experienced by the psalmist right here. Distance from his friends, made repulsive to them. I'm shut in and cannot go out. This is, this speaks to a very current epidemic. And I don't even use that term out of term and out of my expertise. I'm saying what therapists are saying right now, that they have used the term epidemic to describe the, the state of things. We have, we, we are surrounded by and, and, and constantly accompanied by these ubiquitous devices that are supposed to let us connect with each other, but we have never been more lonely. Loneliness is at an is at epidemic levels right now, and there's nothing worse for the human body and the human spirit, the human experience, than this kind of isolation. It's what we do to punish criminals, and it's what life is like right now for a lot of hurting people. Again, the Psalms give vocabulary to those who are in the pit. My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry out to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Oh, this is, this is gut-wrenching when you're in this place, but from the outside looking in, because my soul is in a good place right now. Thank you, God. Uh, I do find beauty in that act of spreading out your hands to God amidst your desperation. All right, we've seen, we've seen teachings about the nature of prayer. We saw, we see a parable about a woman who's just going to knock on the door and knock on the door until eventually God lets her in. This kind of consistent, persistent prayer, it has a sanctifying effect and it stinks to go through such sanctification. But there is beauty in the worship. And if God is glorified by your praise from the pit, then something good came from it. There's something about that particular brand of praise that is offered up to God from the bottom of the pit. You really mean it. You really need him. You are reminded ever more of your need for God. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do departed spirits rise up to praise you? Selah. All right, God glorify yourself in my redemption because I, I can't work wonders for dead people. Departed spirits don't rise up to praise you. If I'm in the pit of Sheol, then I'd, what, you know, I don't know if my praise will reach you. Will your faithful love be declared in the grave? Your faithfulness in Abaddon? We'll talk more about what, what this means. There's a, apocalyptic significance to this word. Will your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? But I call to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer meets you. All right, that man, that's a good way to set a tone for the day right there. Starting off the day in worship. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? It's striking because this is a psalmist who's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. You'll see this kind of dramatic reflective language in the Psalms. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, as David would pray in Psalm 51. He knew that he was sealed permanently, chosen by God to be king of Israel, known before the foundations of the earth. But this is how David felt in the moment. Again, it gives vocabulary to express what's in the anguished soul. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? From my youth, I've been suffering in near death. I suffer your horrors. I am desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They close in on me from every side. You have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. I know that it's bleak, but it does give vocabulary to those who have a lot to say to God. It does give words to things that are hard to express. These psalms come from a place of darkness. And you can see that some of the songs of Korah are incredibly beautiful. This week, we're going to go through all of them. All right, we've seen Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 in some of the original texts. That's one passage, Psalms 44 through 49. Uh, psalms, uh, what is it, 87 and 88? I think 84 and 85. These are the songs of Korah. And this week, we're going to go through all of them. 
Wherever you are, there's going to be one of the songs of Korah that will minister to your soul. If either of these two psalms has spoken to you, if it's blessed you, if it's given words to something that was in your heart, let me know in the comments and share this with someone. I think that you'll find what I have found since I was a little boy, that the psalms are inexhaustible. They are absolutely inexhaustible. I pray that they enhance your prayer life. I pray that this is a week of worship for you, whether you feel like you're down in the pits of Sheol or you feel like you're at the city gates of Zion. Either way, wherever you are, there's a song of Korah that'll give your soul words to sing out to God. So sing to him every day, all week long. Amen.